Before we start learning how to program FPGAs, we'll first take a look at what they are and how they function. Instead of jumping straight in with FPGAs, however, we'll first take a look at some more simple programmable logic devices. Simple Programmable Logic Devices, or SPLDs, were first developed in the early 1970s. They're silicon chips which have an undefined function at the time of manufacture. They can be used to implement digital circuits of varying specifications and can be chosen depending on parameters like the number of gates required, the number of inputs and outputs, or things like maximum operating frequency. They tend to have a small number of gates available and are perfect for small logic designs. There are two major types of SPLD, programmable array logic or generic array logic. The PAL is an SPLD at its most basic. It contains a programmable array of AND gates that can connect to a fixed array of OR gates. The columns of the array are connected to our inputs and their complements, which can in turn be connected to the AND gates through programmable links called cells. This allows any sum of products expression with a defined number of variables to be implemented. In PALs, the cells are fuses and are broken in order to disconnect the inputs from the gates, leaving only the links which are required. This type of destructive programming means that PALs are only one-time programmable, so the design must be valid in order to avoid wasting the chip. In a generic array logic device, the fuses are replaced by transistors, which are enabled or disabled on startup using a technology such as EEPROM or SRAM. This makes the GAL inherently reprogrammable, so designs can be reconfigured multiple times after manufacture. In both types of SPLD, the output from the AND arrays will be passed to fixed OR gates. These OR gates are in turn connected to some additional output logic. This extra logic could contain multiplexers, buffers or registers, depending on the complexity of the device. An OR gate combined with its associated output logic is called a macro cell. In complex logic devices and FPGAs, macro cells can themselves be reprogrammed to function as desired. For example, through components such as tri-state buffers, a single macro cell could be configured to work as an input or output or change between active high or active low, depending on what the design requires. The next step up in complexity for programmable logic devices are complex programmable logic devices, or CPLDs. CPLDs are single devices consisting of multiple SPLDs connected through a programmable interconnect. This allows them to perform more logic operations than a single SPLD and in turn fit larger digital circuits on board. CPLDs are organized into logic array blocks or labs, each containing a number of macro cells. Each lab is functionally equivalent to a single SPLD. In CPLDs, not only are the labs programmed, but the interconnects as well. This allows designers to string together multiple labs to implement incredibly complex logic designs. Similar to GALs, the majority of CPLDs are reprogrammable, and we use either EEPROM or SRAM technology to retain their logic after power down. CPLD macro cells differ somewhat from those on an SPLD. They contain five AND gates and include a product term selection matrix. This matrix routes signals from the AND gates to the OR gates as required, so if only three of the AND gates are used, the last two can be disconnected from the OR gate. In this configuration, each macro cell can produce up to five product terms for its output. If it needs more than five terms, it can use an expander term from another macro cell. Shared expanders feed one product term of the macro cell back into the AND array for use by other macro cells. This not only avoids replication of terms across cells, but it also allows SOP expressions with more than the standard number of inputs to be generated. In this example, we're using two macro cells to generate two SOP expressions. Macro cell 2 generates the product term NOT E and NOT F, and feeds it through an inverter back into the array as E or F, where it is used by macro cell 1 to generate its expression. Parallel expanders allow borrowing of unused product terms from other macro cells to expand a SOP expression. As we can see in this example, the entire SOP expression from macro cell 1 is fed into the product selection matrix of macro cell 2, allowing macro cell 2's output to include the product terms from both cells. The use of expanders is incredibly important within both CPLDs and FPGAs, as without them we would be incredibly limited by the number of variables and products allowed in our designs. So now that we've covered programmable logic devices in increasing complexity, it's time to look at the most complex of them all, FPGAs. 
FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. It is also a complex programmable logic device, but has a different architecture from other CPLDs. Due to this difference in architecture, FPGA devices are able to utilize a number of equivalent gates in orders of magnitude higher than a similar size CPLD. Modern FPGAs aren't just limited to logic blocks, even the most low-end devices will contain hardcore elements such as memory blocks, transceivers, protocol controllers, and even CPUs. These IP blocks are hardwired at manufacture and are not always configurable. They're implemented to save developers time during the design process and will be optimized for the particular device which they're based on. Taking a look at FPGA architecture, we can see some similarities to that of the CPLD. We have three basic elements or primitives, configurable logic blocks, input-output blocks, and the interconnections between them. Unlike CPLDs, these primitives are arranged in a row-column architecture with interconnects running between them, allowing for efficient routing of the signals throughout the device. Going one step closer to examine a logic block, we can see that each one is made up of multiple smaller logic modules or elements, with a local programmable interconnect to connect them together as required. Each of these logic elements is somewhat analogous to a macro cell in a CPLD, in that the desired function is the same, but the way in which they perform it is fundamentally different. In an FPGA, instead of having a programmable array of AND gates, inputs are simply fed into a lookup table. These lookup tables have been programmed to produce SUP functions and generate that output depending on the status of the input data lines. The next screencast in this lab session talks more in depth about lookup tables and how they work. The logic elements will also contain some associated logic, which can configure the element to be used for combinational functions, registered functions, or a combination of both. Once we get started with the quarters, we can take a better look at how these logic elements look on our device. As mentioned previously, FPGAs can contain what's known as hardcore logic. A hard core is a portion of logic in an FPGA that is put in by a manufacturer to provide a dedicated function. Hard cores themselves cannot be reprogrammed, although may have some programmable features. If a hard core does have these programmable features, it is known as soft core. As you can tell, FPGAs are very complicated devices, and designing for them requires a certain amount of low-level appreciation. That said, we don't program FPGAs on an element-by-element -element basis. Using design software such as Quartus, we're able to describe circuits using a hardware definition language and allow the software to take over the smart stuff, compiling our design down to a series of lookup table equations, registers, and connections. Large FPGA designs can use the equivalent of tens of thousands of gates, and for this reason, compilation is an incredibly slow process. A design utilizing over 10,000 gates is likely to take over 30 minutes for a full compile. We can't just compile every time we change a line of code and hope for the best, like we might do with a microcontroller. For this reason, a lot of FPGA design involves rigorous simulations of small parts of the system to ensure that they perform as functioned when used as part of a larger design. With such a complex compilation process, we need an appreciation of how the compiler itself actually works, as well as the design flow for FPGA development. In our design entry stage, we describe a digital circuit using some form of HDL. The most common languages are VHDL and Verilog, the latter of which we'll be using in this module. Some design software allows you to design using a graphical schematic entry, but this isn't considered best practice for large designs. Before we decide to commit our design to hardware, each part should be simulated to ensure it performs as expected. Unlike a microcontroller, FPGA designs cannot easily be paused in situ for debugging to take place. Combinational circuits are asynchronous and therefore either work as expected or don't. We perform simulation either manually or through the use of test benches using a third-party piece of simulation software such as ModelSim. Once your design's function has been verified, we can begin to commit it to hardware. The analysis and synthesis stages of compilation take your schematic design and turn it into primitives which can be mapped onto an FPGA device. During the analysis stage, the compiler will take each part of the design and test it with all possible inputs to determine a SOP expression for the output. This allows the number of equivalent gates to be minimized as well as to eliminate any redundant logic. The synthesis stage then turns the analyzed expressions into a netlist of FPGA primitives, which can be implemented on a device. 
Despite its name, the implementation stage doesn't actually program anything to the device. During this stage, the compiler runs a series of complex algorithms to determine how best to fit the synthesized design onto a given FPGA device. Each device has a finite number of resources that can be used, and therefore the compiler needs to check that the design can actually fit. Then, the synthesized primitives are given a mapping to their physical counterparts on the chip. This is known as placing. The compiler also generates the routing between the place primitives, so that the interconnects can be programmed to link all elements up as they should be. With the design mapped to specific primitives on the device, a second round of simulation needs to take place to ensure that the timings are correct. With FPGAs operating at such high speeds, the distance between logic elements and other primitives can have an effect on the function of the design. Performing a timing simulation allows the designer to verify that there will be no issues to do with missed signals or glitch states due to connected elements being too far apart. We'll be talking about this in detail when we cover propagation delay later in the semester. Once everything has been verified, the device can finally be programmed, physically implementing the synthesized design onto the chip's primitives.